It's Fertility Factor Fiction again. We are super excited to have you guys all back here. And this week's topic is whether or not platelet-rich plasma can improve your ovarian function and whether or not that's something that um, is going to be uh, helpful for women who have diminished ovarian reserve or low AMH. What is platelet-rich plasma? Platelet-rich plasma is a fraction of your blood that includes a very strong or, or high concentration of platelets, and they believe there are some stem cells in there as well often. And the theory is that this has a stronger regenerative potential for healing. So it's used in a number of different types of um, medical services. So the orthopedics guys use it, my own son had it several times um, for some hip uh, injury that he had. Um, it's used in hair restoration, they're using it in um, skin treatments and so on to try and improve your body's healing capacity. How does it do this? Well, it is chock full of all sorts of medication, not medication, sorry, but chemicals, cytokines and um, growth factors that can really help improve the sort of resourcefulness and the ability of your immune system and your body to kind of regenerate itself and so that's why it's part of the regenerative medicine field so as an example they say in at least this one article it has been postulated that the heightened regenerative properties of platelet-rich plasma, which we just call PRP for short, may be explained by higher concentrations of growth factors, such as transforming growth factor beta or TGF beta, insulin-like growth factors one and two, vascular endothelial growth factor, which we know has a huge impact in the ovary, epidermal growth factor, basic fibroblast growth factor, and hepatocyte growth factor. So all of these are growth factors which can kind of help improve things help restore the function of tissues and so the question became can we do this in the ovary and will it help regenerate things so I will tell you a little story because this is kind of interesting this is a, an opportunity to take something really kind of cool um, that has definitely shown some benefit in certain fields of medicine and apply it to our field with the hopes that it's really going to make a difference so I had a patient who was definitely in her more advanced reproductive years and she came to me and and said I've heard that we can do this in Greece and I want to do this and I said well you know the problem isn't doing it to regenerate the ovary the problem is the egg quality is still going to be hampered because of the genetics and she was close to 50 so we know that a substantial proportion of the eggs will not be ideal because they will be genetically abnormal at that stage so she insisted that she wanted to do this and when I tried to explain to her that the results would definitely not be favorable and that the likelihood that this would succeed would be low, she insisted that this should be possible. So she did go to Greece and this is a very good example for the studies we'll be reviewing tonight and there they actually were able to stimulate her ovaries and produce two blastocysts and she transferred the blastocysts and they did not work. So the question isn't whether or not it's going to make you an embryo and this is true of all things in infertility and, and, and in vitro fertilization in particular, the real question is, is it going to achieve a live birth? So I want to review some articles with you guys tonight, which have come out fairly recently. One's from 2019 in October, and then there's a more recent one that was just um, very recent, published in uh, um, January, end of January of this year. So the one back in October is called Live Birth Rates in Poor Responders Group After Previous Treatment with Autologous, that means the same patient, platelet-rich plasma and low-dose ovarian stimulation compared with uh, poor responders used only low-dose ovarian stimulation before IVF. So in this study, they took a group of patients, did intravaginal injections, of PRP through the vagina, just like you're doing an egg retrieval, but instead of sucking out fluid, they injected the ovaries with the PRP and then looked through it to see if the patients would improve their success rates. So the interesting thing here 
was that when they compared the groups, the ages were roughly the same, the body mass index was actually very thin, um, relatively healthy women. Their infertility duration was the same, their partner's age was the same, pretty much everything was the same, including their their FSH um, prior to starting and their AMH levels prior to starting. Uh, AMH was a little bit higher in the group that did not receive the PRP. So when they looked at the number of eggs that were collected between the two groups, there was no difference. And then when they looked at the duration of stimulation, there was also no difference. So you weren't getting more eggs if you had the PRP injections, and you also weren't getting a shorter stimulation, um, which often is reflective of the quality of the eggs. So then they went and looked at the actual outcomes of the IVF cycle. So if you look at the fertilization rate, they did not have a difference in the number of eggs that were fertilized between the two groups. The implantation rate did not differ between the two groups. The clinical pregnancy rate did not differ between the two groups, and neither did the live birth rate. Although, there were substantial differences in the actual numbers. So if you look at their research, it shows that, as an example, clinical pregnancy rate in the PRP group was 33. Um, versus only 10, uh, sorry, and these are percents, in the group that did not receive PRP. So that's quite a difference, right? 33 versus 10. But when you do the actual statistics, it shows that there's actually no difference between those two. Same thing with live birth. They had a 40% rate in the PRP group and only a 14% rate in the non-PRP group. But again, that was not statistically significant and it wasn't even close to being statistically significant. So when you do these calculations, we always use something called a p-value. The p-value is the chance that you're finding out the result sort of by, by random luck. And if your p-value is less than 0.05, then it means it really looks like it's a, a statistical truth. If your p-value is over 0.05, but under 0.07, there is what they call a trend. In this study, it was 0.7, so 10 times the level needed for a trend. So somebody else tried this more recently. This was a little bit of a different study. They had um, 46 patients who underwent the PRP treatment, 37 that they compared them to that did not. And in this study, they actually brought the patients back for three months and injected the PRP into their ovary for three successive months because it can take about that long for an egg to be recruited and then ready to grow and develop. So they wanted to give themselves the best chance to get a robust response. So in that study, the very interesting thing was the levels of the hormones that they analyzed. So when they looked at women's AMH levels, your anti-malarian hormone levels, they showed almost a 50% increase in your AMH level after these injections. So this gets everybody excited, right? How do we make AMH go up? There's absolutely no way to make AMH go up. But in this study, when they injected the PRP, your AMH actually goes up. So they went from a mean of 0.62, and that's in um, the nanograms per mil, up to 1.01 nanograms per mil, highly statistically significant. For their FSH, it dropped from 13.6, which is quite elevated, down to 9.07, which is more normal. Anything under 12 makes us a lot less worried. And the antral follicle count went from 4 for the pretreatment to 7 for the post-treatment group. So these are quite significant, and all of these were highly statistically significant, and they're clinically significant, because when we see those differences, we say, wow, that's really impressive. So this sort of led me to thinking this was very hopeful. But then you go back and you look again at the outcomes, and here it really got interesting. So the biochemical pregnancy rate, so that's just testing positive for your beta HCG level, was statistically significantly higher. It was 12% in the PRP group and only 2% in the control group. So that's a, quite a huge difference. I, I'm sorry, it was a number of 12 and 2, which reflected 26% and 5.4%. So quite a significant difference, a five-fold increase difference, and that was statistically statistically significant. So you are seeing more embryos implant. 
And then they looked at the clinical pregnancy rate, which is our ability to see a positive heartbeat. And again, they showed a 23.9% in the PRP group and a 5.4% in the control group. And that was again, highly significant. So again, we're actually now getting to the point where we're not only seeing you get pregnant, we're actually seeing the fetus develop and a heartbeat be present. But when they looked at live birth rate, again, there was no difference in live birth rate. So some of these are going on to miscarry or they are genetically abnormal and being terminated. And so despite the fact that it looks really promising, you're seeing substantial changes in the AMH, you're seeing substantial changes in the clinical pregnancy rate, the chemical pregnancy rate, all of these seem really, really hopeful. At the end of the day, we need there to be an improvement in your live birth rate. If you are a poor responder, we know that even if we make you make more eggs, we can't change the genetics of your eggs. Nothing can do that. And unfortunately, because the genetics can be compromised, you're gonna end up with a higher risk of failure and or miscarriage, no matter how good we are at promoting the development of an embryo. So factor fiction for this week was, does PRP actually help you achieve a live birth Birth, and the answer is no, it is a fiction. As far as we know right now, there is absolutely no evidence that supports the use of PRP for improving live birth outcomes in either IUI or IVF cycles. So with that in mind, I'm going to open up 